Well, welcome into another episode of the Winsome Creationist. I am super excited and delighted to finally have my friend, Dr. Marcus Ross, on the podcast after what seems like way too long. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me, man. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Steve. It's great to be on the Winsome Creationist with you. Man, I've, I've been looking forward to this for, for quite some time um, because, you know, one of the things that when I think of a winsome creationist, honestly, the first person that comes to my mind is you. And I, and I mean that just because of everything that I've seen, all of your interactions and our past interactions. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really a breath of fresh air to see somebody who has a public platform and who is knowledgeable and, you know, isn't rude, um, frankly, actually taking creationism to the streets, as it were, and um, maybe even a little bit in the lion's den at some of these, um, you know, theological conferences and things like that. So it's, um, it's very much awesome to see someone such as yourself to really start, you know, making an impact and an influence um, in some of these places. So I feel like I should just say thank you for that. Well, well, thank you. Uh, that's very, very kind. And uh, I appreciate the sentiment and I appreciate the sentiment of the Winsome Creationist as, as a program, as a podcast, uh, your approach as a host. Um, you know, it's the sort of thing that uh, I think, you know, we could use a lot more of in Young Earth Creationism and, and across the board, you know, in society <laughs> when it comes down to it. You know, the ability to articulate a position, um, to argue for it without being argumentative. Uh, mm -hmm. is really uh, a skill that we need to recover. Um, you know, not that it's uh, not that the United States' history has uh, been free of argumentative, uh, argumentative approaches. I mean, from the very beginning, you look back at some of the early political cartoons of the colonies, it's like, <laughs> wow, this is, this is pretty rough stuff here. Um, but yeah. yeah, you know, the, the opportunities that have arisen for me uh, as of late, in part because of this kind of approach of presenting your position with hopefully strength, but with grace uh, and with kindness uh, added to it uh, doesn't mean that you can't be strong, doesn't mean that you can't be firm. And there are times when stronger words might be necessary. But for the majority of our conversations, uh, both within the church and without, uh, you know, the, you know, the old adage, you're going to attract more flies with honey than with vinegar, uh, really does yeah. lead in, into this. And um, you know, this, is, this is a approach that the Lord really had to work on me for a long time and is not uh, hopefully finished <laughs> with this yet. Uh, you know, I still have plenty of, of those times when somebody says something like, oh, I, you know, I want to hit back. I want to hit back hard, right? And, and we have to instill within ourselves virtues and disciplines and uh, those types of terms, especially in Protestantism, we don't talk about virtues quite as, as often, but they really are the sorts of things that are disciplines of behavior um, that are fruits of the spirit uh, of being meek, you know, in the sense of, you know, being willing to listen, being willing to lead and not to do so in an ar angry, argumentative sort of way, uh, to be, you know, the type of person that people want to listen to, I, I think is one of those things that, you know, your program does really well. There's a lot of people who are willing to listen to the winsome creationist because they don't feel like they're going to get beat up in the process of engaging in a conversation. Nobody, none of us want to go into a conversation where we're going to get insulted. Um, mm. but all of us seem to want to, uh, be, be the lead on a conversation, which somebody else gets insulted, right? This is, this is the way that we have to tame the tongue as we're told so frequently in a few books of the new Testament in particular, you know, how dangerous it is. So, um, you know, I, I've had to learn a lot growing up within the, the standard kind of creationist approach. It's not only, or, you know, for an opponent, you're wrong, but your mother's ugly. And, you know, we've got to, <laughs> we've got to come back from doing that sort of thing, because, you know, while that yeah. rallies the troops, sometimes it doesn't add uh, to the ranks. Yeah, I uh, what a great what a great example. I'm, I'm working on um, spoiler alert. I don't know. I'm working on a book project uh, that has sort oh. of the namesake of this um, of this podcast. I'm about thirty five thousand words in. Um, and one of the things that I. Um, I believe I said in there is that the the current state of things, the way this conversation happens, is um, it, it only serves to entertain the convinced, right? It mm. doesn't do very much to actually invite the unconvinced into a um, into a conversation like this. And the irony of that whole thing is that isn't that what we're trying to do? Like all these you know ministries and these groups that are putting content out. 
what is the content for? I mean, is it really just there to entertain the convinced? Or if, if, it's, if it truly is apologetics in nature, the whole point of apologetics is to be persuasive and give reasons for the defense of the hope that you have. And so if that's what we're trying to do, how do you, I mean, how can you um, persuade someone if you don't have a persuasive attitude and a persuasive character? Nobody's going to listen to you. So yeah, you may be able to entertain the people in your echo chamber. And by the way, I get that what we're talking about is not as sexy. You know, I mean, uh, among other reasons, it's why I have like 260 subscribers and many others have a lot more. You know, it's a lot more fun to poke fun and uh, poke fun at other people and, you know, to um, to ridicule them and a lot, you know, to say controversial things and whatnot. Whereas here, we're mostly focused on bringing a different color to the debate, right? Bringing bringing a different and, and, and frankly, not even engaging in the debate, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about uh, in this episode, a little bit different. But um, I think it's important to realize that we don't have to, you know, just because we're being winsome and being persuasive, it doesn't mean that we don't stand firm in what we believe. I would encourage everybody to go. Um, you can search, you can find this pretty easily on YouTube. It's Dr. Ross representing the young age creationist view of Adam um, at the, uh, is it the ETS? Is it Evangelical Theological Society? That's right. Yeah, yeah it was uh, this past year's uh, ETS in 2023. And the YouTube can be found uh, especially easily um, because it's on uh, William Lane Craig's uh, channel, uh, which is, um, it. oh, what's it? I just forgot the name of it. Um, like Reasonable Faith. Reasonable Faith. That's right. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, that was part of a, a whole afternoon session dedicated with four presenters, three respondents, and then Q&A for the audience. And so they broke that up into four videos, one for Bill Craig's presentation, because, you know, it's his organization. Uh, yeah. Another video for the other three respondents, uh, three um, presenters, myself included, another video th for three respondents, and then about an hour's worth of uh, Q&A with the audience. Very so it, it was very substantive um, session, very, very substantive. Okay. Very, yeah, very good. I haven't even watched all of that yet. It's it's the Q&A that I primarily watched. And one of the things I noticed, um, because I'm so it, probably no surprise with the title of my podcast, I hate conflict, right? I really don't like conflict. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not typically the alpha male in any particular situation unless, unless, the, unless it's a, really a hill worth dying on. You know, I'm not a conflict kind of guy. I, I try to be easygoing. And so one of the things I noticed is that, um, you know, while you were very winsome and very persuasive, you were also, in my opinion, um, you know, like, yeah, this is not right or this has serious challenges. And, and, and you, you know, so I think there's this boldness to still speak the truth. But according to the biblical model, you know, to to speak the truth in, in love. So I, I would invite you if you have any thoughts on specifically what I said, that's great. But then just in general, if you wanted to talk about anything significant or that you really enjoyed or, or something that you think is important about the historical Adam things that you've been involved in recently, I, I invite that. Well, thank you. You know, the, the issue of Adam and his, Adam's historicity and uh, questions of paleoanthropology were never ones that interested me. Uh, I got, I got drug into <laughs> this, uh, kind of kicking and screaming and because they couldn't find anybody else. Um, so, uh, the backstory for this is that, uh, I'm part of a multiple views book that is coming out in August of 24, uh, called perspectives on the historical Adam and Eve. And uh, this book uh, emerged out of uh, William Wayne Craig's mind. He wanted a, a book once he had finished his um, uh, historical Adam book of his own in quest of the historical mm -hmm. Adam. He uh, immediately wanted there to be more discussion, right? So uh, you get your book out and then you want to yep. keep the ball kind of rolling, right? You want more of your, your ideas being kicked around. So he, he kicked out the idea to Brogman and Holman, b &H Press, uh, that we could do a multi-view perspective on this. The last one was done in about 2013, 2014. So it'll be about 10 years. And there's a couple of new perspectives that have shown up in evangelicalism since that other one, uh, which included, um, oh, Jack Collins, John Walton, um, Denny Lamoureux, and uh, Bill Barrick. So the four perspectives on that, a couple of theistic evolutionary perspectives, kind of an old earth view and a young earth view. Since then, um, two major new perspectives uh, propositions have come forth. And, and one of them is Bill Craig's in which he says, we can have a singular historical Adam if we put them tremendously deep in time, like 700,000 years ago as a member of maybe Homo Heidelbergensis. Basically, his argument is that Neanderthals are human. 
and we are human. Therefore, we must, if Adam is real and he thinks the New Testament compels us to that in like two or three verses, um, but then we've got to have the, the juncture point between those two species. Adam's got to be down there. So he chooses uh, that time frame on the basis of recognizing the humanity of the Neanderthals and, and us, which I applaud. I, I do, uh, I completely agree with uh, William Lane Craig that Neanderthals evidence humanity in all kinds of different ways. I think that that needs to be extended even further out. Yeah. Um, but that would put it deeper in time and in older perspective, such as he holds. And he, he doesn't, he, he looks at Homo erectus. He's like, nah, no way. They're not complicated enough or, or what have you. But anyway, so he's got this new view. And of course, uh, in 2019, Joshua Swamidas presented a, a book length treatise on the genealogical Adam and Eve, uh, which does kind of the opposite. It says we can have Adam and Eve really, really recently, even just, you know, six or 10,000 years ago uh, with evolution, as long as they are just our genealogical ancestors, as long as they are just one of our many great, 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 great grandparents. But as long as everybody can trace themselves through their family lineage eventually to Adam and Eve, then everybody is in Adam, so everybody can be in Christ. So Swamidas's argument is that by the time we get to Jesus, everybody on the earth needs to be in Adam so that the gospel can go to all people. But it also does mean that there's this period of time where you have parallel trajectories of people who are in Adam and other people who are not. People who mm. possibly could be offered salvation and others historically who are not able to have that. You get so you know, yeah, that, that, that's, that's kind of gets muddy real quick. Yeah, very muddy. So representing that kind of view is Andrew Lope. He's also a philosopher. He has a genealogical perspective. He prefers a little bit deeper in time. He'd like Adam to be like 50 to 100,000 years old. Um, mm -hmm. And different from Swamidas, Lope thinks that anybody outside of Adam's lineage is not human. So even if they look like you and me, even if they speak and have intellects like you and I do, and even if they perform religious rites and practices in their societies, if they are not descended from Adam, they're not human. They are technically animals. Um, and that gets even worse. That's real difficult. Um, yeah. That gets, yeah. Now, he does that because he recognizes that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are talking about the same people. Swamidas tries to get around this by saying, well, maybe in Genesis 1, God creates people in general. And then in Genesis 2, he yeah. makes Adam and Eve in specific. So- each of them have their own ways to try and do this. So because those views are new and are being kicked around and, and Craig's like, hey, let's, let's make a new book. The two end members then are uh, myself representing Young Earth Creation. And then on the far um, liberal side, if you will, the left end of, of this is somebody who's no longer actually an evangelical uh, anymore, Kenton Sparks. Um, and he holds to an errantist view of the Bible. So the Bible is a very human work about God and God's working with us, but let's not mistake this for inerrancy, right? There's a lot of problems in the right, Bible, yeah. what have you. So, you know, I look at that and I think, you know, Bill Craig kind of, you know, he, he picked his end members of an, of an errantist and no evangelical picking up this book is going to want to go here and a young right. earth creationist that he considers, you know, this position so disreputable that nobody's going to want to go here. And so you've got your reasonable two options sitting in the middle. Um, I, I yeah. think, and I hope, <laughs> Uh, that I gave him a lot of trouble in in trying to set up that construction. I actually think that Kenton Sparks' chapter in this book is very strong. Um, I don't I don't like an errant perspective on the Bible at all, but he presents a cogent and coherent argument for himself. Um, and I don't find Bill Craig or Andrew Loke's chapters um, very convincing. I, I find uh, Bill Craig's chapter is kind of breezy. Quick summary of the book, not a lot of footnoting, just kind of, I know what I'm talking about and, and here it is. Uh, Loke's chapter is much more difficult yeah. to even understand. Um, he, he doesn't kind of lay out the details of his model. He just checks his model against a whole bunch of theological, philosophical boxes to see if it can work. And if it can, then it's an option on the table. So he doesn't mm. flesh out what it is. He just kind of says, here's what, here's what we got to be able to check off in order for this to be possible. And if so, my model is possible. Um, and, and therefore it's actually good and probably the best. So you'll, you'll get a sense of that if you watch the, um, the presentations, um, uh, from the ETS video, but, yeah. uh, yeah, this was never my wheelhouse. I like dinosaurs. I like marine reptiles. I like fossils and rocks and people. I'm just, I'm an introvert. People don't do it for me. Right. right? Same. <laughs> yeah, I get it. 
So yeah. Uh, yeah, getting pulled into this was um, kind of surprising, but it started with responding to Josh's book a few years ago and, and a few other things like that. And, um, and so now here I am, uh, I owe a, a huge debt of gratitude to my sister, uh, Dr. Jillian Ross. She's an Old Testament scholar. Uh, she's a Hebraist and, and uh, all that sort of stuff. She teaches at Liberty University, where I was uh, for a good long time as well. And uh, she just kept dragging me over to these meetings. It's like, Marcus, you need to talk to people. And oh, by the way, you need to talk to them nicer. Um, stop, stop mm -hmm. with the way that creationists talk. Uh, so I, you know, a lot of this kind of winsome attitude that you and I are, are trying to do here, at least on my, uh, for, for my part, I owe to uh, my sister who looks at this and said, this is not the way that people communicate well. You need to learn to do better. <laughs> Um, and, and uh, yeah, I, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. Man, that's really cool to have an influence like that. That's so close, but especially not mm -hmm. only that's so close to you, but that's so close to others to kind of say like, yeah, this is why you're not getting any attention in the Academy, because if they talked yeah. like this in the Academy, you know, and it's like, it's like, and pardon me, you know, I, I'm, I'm not one to really like name names, but okay. I'm going to name names for a minute. Like, to have Ken Ham part of a four or five views book, just give me a break, okay? Like, um, not nothing against him, great guy, I'm sure. But when it comes to a scholarly representation of the young age creationist view, there needs to be somebody who can handle the text well and handle the science pretty well. And so I'm mm -hmm. I'm thrilled to see somebody like you sort of taking up that mantle um, and uh, even against your will, in a sense, um, being being willing to do that. Um, it's yeah, it's it's quite incredible. And the historical Adam issue, you know, this is one um, this is one of those interesting places. And I know we're not even supposed to be talking about the historical Adam. We're going to get to the actual subject matter here in a minute. I promise. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone's waiting with bated breath what we're actually going to talk about. But man, um, on the historical Adam thing, it's such an important thing. And Dr. Craig's um, contribution, if you will, to this discussion over the past few years has has been one of the more interesting things from my perspective because we've been able to say okay look here's a person who really knows how to there's actually a few things here he really knows how to handle the text he's a philosopher so he knows how to think a phd philosopher and a phd theologian right mm -hmm. so he understands the broader perspectives on how to think but also how to think well about theology and and so when he makes statements like well, the young earth creationist position is eminently plausible and deserves to be dealt with, right? It deserves to be, yeah. to, to be considered. Um, that's important. When he says things like, I see evidence for humanity in the Andertal such that it's worth the expensive cost of pushing Adam 750,000 years into the future. That's interesting. That's a good thing, you know, uh, for us. You know, when he, I did a whole article responding to his his strange notion that he doesn't seem to have consulted, unfortunately, a, um, you know, a, and, and a, a uh, old Testament scholar commentary because uh, they're all over there where, where he says that one of the reasons why he thinks that Genesis, uh, one and two, that could be considered in the category of myth is seeing God walking in the garden in the, in the cool yeah. of the day. And I, I did, a, I did like a 5,000 word blog post response to that of like, well, literally nobody else on the planet thinks so narrowly about this passage as you do. So anyway, we it, uh, Dr. Craig's insertion into this debate has been an interesting one because as young age creationists, there's lots of things that we want to point to and we can say, oh, well, th he's actually shining a light on some really important areas. And and why I think a lot of young age creationists like it is because um, he doesn't necessarily hide where he's biased, right? I mean, he's very clear that he thinks the young age creationist position is a non-starter from a scientific perspective. And mm -hmm. so... Um, it helps it helps make the battle lines, if you will, in the conversation, if we can call them that, a little bit uh clearer. So I'm yeah, but I'm glad to have a, a representative like you taking up that torch. So it's good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I, it's it really is uh interesting because with with Bill Craig, just to kind of maybe finish up a little bit on on this, you know, he re he refers like several times in his book and he does so in his essay and some of the other things that are available that you can read, you know, as he summarizes his book on on, you know, I don't remember it was Christianity Today or some of the other, you know, major websites, right? Mm -hmm. He says, you know, basically we we have to face, you know, we have to deal with uh, the terrifying possibility that the young earth creationist hermeneutic is correct. Like he uses this word terrifying. And yeah. it's like, you know, if they're right, if those young age creationists are right, 
we are doomed, right? Uh, mm. and, and doomed to probably go to something like Kenton Sparks' errancy view right. um, or errantist view. That's kind of what I think he's he's at, which is sort of why he structures you know, the, the multiple book views way. book this way. <laughs> um, it, it is kind of yeah. interesting to see how the four of us in the book sort out into categories similar to the categories that he creates in, in, uh, in Quest of the Historical Adam. Um, but yeah, when he brings a, a new perspective and, and unlike most old earth creationists, um, although Craig is perfectly compatible with evolution as well, but I'll, I'll put him in the old earth creationist category here for the moment. You know, he's willing to push Adam way, way back. And we have historically not seen that, you know, most old age creationists have said, you know, 50,000 years, 60, maybe a hundred, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, although now yeah. you're seeing some folks in the intelligent design, you know, organizations hint that they'd be comfortable going further back because they too are, are looking at Neanderthals and going, I don't think that we can withhold from them, you know, the status of humanity when they are uh, making co composite tools. They're actually using glues that they have invented in order to affix uh, points onto spears, right? Whereas Homo sapiens at the time is still wrapping things with twine, you know, they're taking some kind of glue and affixing it together. Interestingly, a glue that's not sticky to the fingers. There's a newspaper that just came out like a couple of weeks ago, uh, evaluating some of the type what? of glue that they were. Yeah, it's this, this awesome, like, you know, pine tar birch that they're that they're uh, curing under underground or, or covered over with heat um, in order to keep it from exposure to oxygen. But anyway, it becomes like this tacky ball. It's like silly putty in a sense. They're able to then affix the stuff and then it hardens over time. So it's really interesting how like these folks that kind of reinvented what they saw in the, in the material from the archeological sites and kind of like, this is what it is. And this is really, this is really cool stuff. Um, you yeah. know, the mind that it, it takes in order to make that is a human mind, um, yeah. you know, that we've got societies, we've got all sorts of things. And, and one of the things that I focus in on, uh, a little bit too, in my, in my chapter, uh, just to give a little preview here is I also focus on some of the, the negative behaviors, uh, that they go into, uh, some of the, the ways in which they, um, you know, murder one another evidences mm. of cannibalism and cannibalism that is not desperate, but is actually decided like we're going to kill these people as part of the regular food that's available to us we'll we'll take deer we'll take elk we'll take small children it's it's really wow. grim oh yeah it uh, there's this uh one one place uh out in spain uh called uh, at the puerca and uh homo um homo antecessor is the name given to the remains there but the remains are all actually juveniles and they've all been butchered and they've all been cannibalized uh so you know, is it a real taxon or, or is it actually something else? It's kind of hard to tell, but nonetheless, whatever it was that was there was captured selectively because children are easier to catch than adults, right? And so you got ages mm. from like three and four or maybe even two all the way up to teen years um, of, of these people who were, you know, unfortunately kidnapped and, and brutally murdered and then consumed raw. Um, and you kind of go, ooh, this is pretty awful. Uh, and yet at the same time, you know, the, the flesh was removed from the bone with stone tools, right? This isn't just gnawing on it or anything like that. This isn't, this isn't hyenas and bears and stuff. This yeah. Is full stuff. It's um, a painful example, but it shows their humanity. Is what it you're does. Saying. And it's fallenness, yeah. which for young age creationist is something that is explicable if we're looking at this as the record of post flood peoples that are migrating out across the planet that are in invading into new areas and, and, um, you know, extending humanity around the world, uh, to do that, you have to say that homo antecessor is human, right? And that it's, uh, even though it's not homo sapiens, it's not Neanderthal, it's something else. Uh, nonetheless, you're, for me, I would say, you know, anatomically, we've got good clues that these are humans, uh, and behaviorally, whatever is doing this to them, whether it's antecessor or another tribe or whatever, they are also uh, giving us evidence of their fallen humanity. Um, and it's that situation where a lot of the old earth and theistic evolution side of things struggle a bit because this is before Homo Heidelbergensis, right? So this is before Bill Craig's yeah. stuff. This is before reasons to believe in their model of, of where humans are. So this just becomes, you know, for them, I guess the, the morally neutral workings of pre-Adamic hominids. 
This is part of the very good creation. Murder, cannibalism, brutality, right? right? You can trace it all through the archaeological record. It's it's our anthropological record. It's not isolated. Um, so you know, those are those are some of the things that we can that we can also bring up in addition to the anatomical things and the, and the cool stuff like making glue and making twine and having you know art and and carvings and stuff like that. But there there's the grim side to humanity as well. And I think young age creationism in particular can handle that issue much much better uh, than than old age and theistic evolutionary perspectives can. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And, and in fact, so let's sh let's shift a little bit here because actually something you said there. So you wrote you wrote an article um, a few years ago now. I think it was 2019 um, on this concept of the of the infinite game of creationism. And it's based on this book. Just for summary sake, it's based on a book called Finite and Infinite Games um, that was written. I, I want to say 86, um, 1986, yep. I think. And then um, Simon Sinek, who is a business author. Um, organizational leader, he wrote a book called um, The Infinite Game a, a few years ago. And I was intrigued because in one of these talks that I was listening to you give actually on the historical Adam, you you talked about you, how you play creationism as an infinite game. And so in the time we have left, um, you know, last 15 minutes or so here, I'd love for you to, um, number one, introduce the concept of the infinite game um, as a as a creationist, and uh, if if you'd like to kind of tie in uh, something that you said a moment ago was um, about how again young age creationists have a way to deal with some of these some of these challenges, gruesome as they may be. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you say in that paper is that um, as creationists, even though we have you know less funding to work with, certainly we don't have as, nearly as many people on our team, so to speak, um, and there's lots of obstacles and challenges creationists face. Um, we face those with joy. You, the way you say it is with joy and with peace because of the confidence that we have in the text. We're so confident that what the text says is right, that we're willing to face criticism. We're willing to face being called names. We're willing to face, a, a, you know, the challenges of, of, of funding and, and the amount of people and all of that um, because we're so confident in the text. So I want to use that as a launching point and just talk a little bit about this concept uh, in general, and then we'll dive a little bit into it before we before we round out. Yeah. So, you know, for many years, I struggled with the right kinds of terminology or phrases when I was explaining things to my students at Liberty University, right? I would say like, you know, we want to be creationists, not just anti-evolutionists. And I think that's, you know, that was, you know, years and years ago, kind of the, the, the stock phrase that I had. Uh, we have to be creationist and being a creationist is not the same as being against something else. So we don't want to define ourselves in terms of opposition or opponents or anything like that. And it would be in, in 2019, that same year that I wrote that essay, um, that Simon Sinek uh, wrote his book, The Infinite Game. Uh, and he published that. And uh, I had already seen Sinek in a few other situations, right? He'd become a pretty hot YouTube commodity. He's a brilliant organizational uh, theorist for businesses. Uh, he's able to go in and kind of see where they have problems and, and go in and solve those. Um, he was the first guy to kind of figure out like, hey, you guys, you're having trouble with millennials and workers. Let me show you why that is, right? Mm -hmm. um, sure. And, and he's just an outstanding communicator and his books are very deep. And, and I was kind of skeptical at first because like business books tend to be fluff. Right? You've probably read yeah. a few. I've read a few. Oh, yeah. They, they tend to be really powder puff stuff. Not Sinek. No, uh, he, he's a different animal altogether. He's very insightful. And so he started talking about Infinite Games and Finite Games, which comes from James Carsey, uh, writing back in, in 1986 with Finite and Infinite Games. So Carsey was a religious studies professor uh, and a humanist. Um, and what he wanted to do was kind of create um, a, an ethic. He wanted to show an ethic of how it is that we can live life well um, when we don't necessarily believe in God. So he said that all human activities that are voluntary, we can call games. Okay, so just we're going to use the term game to refer to anything that we decide to do and engage with. So slavery doesn't count. You're pressed into service, right? Nothing like that. But everything else he's going to say is a game. And he said there's two kinds of games. There are finite games and there are infinite games. Now, finite games is what we usually think of when we think of the word game, right? If I'm going to get together with my kids and we're going to play Settlers of Catan, the game, the only game that really matters, right? We're going to play Settlers of Catan. Um, there's a certain number of players who are going to begin the game. 
And we're going to stay with those number of players the whole way through. The game has a set point. It has an ending point. There are rules, right? You can't bring in monopoly pieces or anything like that. Everything is contained and you have a, a very clear winner at the end of that, right? There's a metric. In this case, you know, it's you have to get to 11 points. Or if we're playing cities and knights, which is really the only way you ought to play it, uh, you got to get to 13, right? So the first person to, to do that wins the game. The game ends. So it has definite beginning, definite end, fixed numbers of players, specific rules and ways that you have to play. And at the end, we know who wins. So those aren't the only kinds of finite games, though. There are all kinds of finite games out there. So as a college professor, we could look at one of my classes as a finite game. It ha the semester has a beginning point. It has an end point. There's a certain number of students that are in my class. They are performing activities and duties for their assignments. And at the end, they get a grade that is a metric that tells them how they did. You know, did they win? You know, did they do well? Did they come in second, third, what have you? But then there's infinite games. And infinite games are rather different because they started at some point, you may or may not know when. Uh, they are a continuous thing uh, that doesn't have a fixed endpoint either. And you just kind of enter into this game as it's going. And the number of people that can be in that game at any given time is not fixed. Okay. So in Settlers of Catan, we've got, you know, two, three, four, five, or six players. That, that's all you can play with. Any more than that, you need another board. And you can't have one person drop out and somebody jumps in and like they're going to start in from the beginning when everybody else has already got seven points. You are doomed, right? So you can't do that with a finite game. But with an infinite game, um, let's say we've got this college class, right? Let's say it's Theology 101. Theology 101 is a finite game, but becoming Christ-like is an infinite game. We enter into the stream of becoming Christ-like. It is not something that we began. It's not something that we're going to end. There are lots of other people that can do that at this time, and we hope for more, right? We actually want more. Amen, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the goal of an infinite game is not to win because I, there's I, no particular metric by which you can fully you know, compare yourself against everybody else. In a finite game, it's points. It's, I won the election. It's, you know, I got an A, whatever that happens to be. There are metrics. But in a, an infinite game, there are no metrics. And the metrics that are being used at any given time to determine who's a good player versus who's not a good player can change. So those can actually shift from time to time as the game changes and adapts to there being different players. So I now run a business. Cornerstone Educational Supply. We may, my wife likes to say we're the science stuff people. So when your curriculum yeah, yeah, says, yeah. Go, you know, when your curriculum says go get some frogs to do a dissection or get some rock kits or get some physics equipment, that's that's what we do, right? We're not the first science supply company that's out there. We're certainly not the first business, right? We have entered into this infinite game of business, and my goal as the owner of this company is not to win. I can't win business. The only thing I can do is play well, right? So the focus yeah. of, of an infinite game is on the player and the game itself. And you're, you stay in the game as long as you have the will and the resources to do so. If I lose the will, I sell my company. If I lose the resources, I'm out of business. If I continue until I've died, well, somebody else is going to have to carry this ball, right? Cornerstone, I hope, will continue in this in this infinite game of business for some time. But I can't compare myself directly against, say, home science tools. They're a lot bigger than we are. They're an excellent company. Uh, they do the science stuff things for homeschoolers better than we do in a lot of ways. Um, if I look at them as my competition, right? Competition is a finite game term. I have a team that I got to beat. Home science tools, I can't beat them, right? But what I've they can be is what Sinek says is a good rival. Sinek says that what you need in an infinite game are rivals who will force you to make your game better, right? So I look at, say, Home Science Tools, and I go, they're really good. Their pricing power is great. Their service is good. Their website is slick, all these things. If I want to be able to compete against them, I've got to be able to do something that is comparable, but I don't want to copy them, right? I've got to play my own game, but I've got to do that in a way that shows that I am a good rival to them Whereas right now they're like, yeah, probably not. 
you know, you're, you're I, not really there. Right. And both of yeah. us pale in comparison to say something like Carolina Biological um, Supply or Ward Scientific. These guys are gargantuan. They're huge. They handle public schools and colleges and whatnot. We're playing around in the homeschooling stuff, right? I look at Carolina Biological. They, they don't have a building. They have a complex, uh, they have a whole complex just a couple hours south of me. But hey, someday that might be a good rival, right? You there know, you I go. Yeah, do totally. That. So, so to turn this to creation then, the, the aim of creation is to discover the works of God you know, or discover, discover really more about God himself. I, really, I should have put it that way in the, in the essay, to discover more about God through the works that he has done, guided by the word he has given us, right? Good. I, I hope so, right? You know, because yeah. this is the way to think about what does it mean for me to do science or to do theology or philosophy as a creationist? What is my goal? In an infinite game, the goal is the game. Well, what's the game? God. God is the game. And I strive to become the best towards that end by making myself as a player better, right? So the focus mm -hmm. of an infinite game is much more internal. So to try to discover more about God through the works that he has made and guided by the word that he has given, that provides us as creationists with a means to move forward that doesn't care about anybody else. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and I would tell that to my students sometimes before I had this language, I'd say, you know, on a, on a certain level, I don't care that evolution is incorrect. I already know that in a sense, right? Or at least I strongly suspect that evolution is incorrect. That can't be my motivation. Defeating evolution cannot be my motivation. A and going through secular programs, as I did, I went to Penn State University, I went to the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, and I went to the University of Rhode Island, right? None of these are Christian schools. They're all state schools. Um, and they don't care what's going on in creationism. So, and, and going through secular schools as I did, I went to Penn State for my undergraduate, I went to South Dakota School of Mines for my master's degree in paleontology, I then went to my home state, University of Rhode Island, uh, for my PhD. And none of those, not a single one was a Christian school, right? It was only when I got to Liberty University as a teacher that I could kind of do science the way that I thought was appropriate. But I can tell you this, uh, there's very few people at those state schools who care one whit what is happening in creationism. Their motivation for, for doing evolutionary work is not because they're trying to defeat creationists. They don't care. We, we're not on the radar. And if our focus is constantly on them, that's finite game thinking, right? The idea that I can defeat an opponent to win my game works in a finite game, right? If I'm in a class, if I'm in a debate, right? If we're on a structured debate, we got a certain amount of time, can I defeat my opponent? That sort of thing. But in the long run, this is not what is going to be able to fuel creationism to actually be creationist. It will only fuel creationists to be anti-evolutionism. We've got a long yeah. history of that in creationism and, and intelligent design and old earth creationism, like all of these kind of started up as in the modern sense as kind of these evolution responses, these evolution protests, like you in England, you have the evolution protest movement, which was yeah. the beginning of kind of the old earth, young earth sort of thing. Intelligent design was entirely focused against naturalism and Darwinism and still is to this day. Young earth creationism was largely against uniformitarianism and against old age views. And there are components where I say, well, of course we are, right? Because we don't hold a uniformitarianism and we don't hold to an ancient earth. But what, what do we actually hold to, right? What is in here, not what is something that I'm trying to push away? That is a radically different way of trying to think about creationism, right? And it yeah. means that the projects and the ideas and the things that I'm going to do are going to be oriented towards the infinite game of understanding God through the things that he has made and the word that he's given. Yep. It yep. doesn't mean right, it, it doesn't mean that you won't eventually do some finite game stuff, right? I'm in this book with multiple perspectives. And my goal certainly is to be the best of those, but I want to be the best of those actually by presenting how young earth creationism makes sense of all these data. There'll be some critiques and, and things like that. 
And, and eventually, sometimes there might be something more. I, I might have to say, hey, you know, there's this particular idea that must be addressed and we must show that it is in, you know, that it is a, against scripture, that is contrary to what we know from the evidence of science, what have you. So there are times, and, and I think um, Gordon Wilson did a good job of kind of bringing some of that up in his essay in the same cluster that was where I presented this view um, that was on the Sapientia website over at the Henry Center. Um, Gordon Wilson was kind of pressed, hey, what do you think about Marcus's infinite, infinite games? And he's kind of like, yeah, well, there's plenty of room for critiques out there. And, you know, he's right. Uh, you look at even the writings of someone like yeah. Augustine, right? And, you know, one of his most famous works, Against the Manichaeans, right? You don't get more finite game <laughs> approach than I'm writing against those people. But you look at City of God, and City of God is entirely uh, infinite game thinking. So you can do both. Mm, yeah, you can yeah. Do both. The key mm. though is to take the finite game stuff that you sometimes need to do, and put it into the service of the infinite game that that animates what you want to do and what you want to be. Amen. Yeah. That. I, so I love this way of thinking because I really think that this is a framework. Like sometimes, um, I don't want to say people criticize, but people have questioned my use of the word winsome, right? And it's like, well, doesn't win some mean that we're basically rolling over? And of course, I explained that already that no, it, it, do, it doesn't mean that. Um, but I, I think that this is, a, for, uh, this is a, a framework or a thought experiment of a way to make what I'm trying to do here when some creationism very practical, right? When you start thinking, I encourage because um, uh, I, next, next time we get together, we're going to have like a, a totally open calendar. Today, I'm pushing against soccer practice, so I have to leave in like two or three minutes. Um, but, uh, but next time, next time, my friend, we will make this a lot longer discussion. Um, but, but I think that this is something that I'm, I'm going to link up the article so that folks can go read your thoughts here for a further um, elaboration. And even in, in the article, which I want to give a plug for real quick, you give some specific examples of people who are playing the infinite game of creationism well. And one of the interesting things is that it seems to me like that conventional scientists realize that they're playing an infinite game, right? That's like you said, they're not think, even thinking about us. We're not really on their radar, even though you know we're always playing that finite game of trying to come after them. The evolutionists are playing an infinite game until they get brought into the creation evolution discussion. And then what they'll do is they'll mm -hmm. pretend like they are playing an, a finite game and claim that they've won over and yep. over again. So in practice, the scientists know they're playing an infinite game, but in a sense, evolutionary apologists want, keep, and, and honestly, this is probably mostly because creationists have played the, the finite game for so long and so loudly um, that, that it just gets drawn up into that debate. But if only both sides, all parties, would realize that what we're doing is playing a infinite game with some miniature finite games sprinkled within, I just think overall it would be a much more pleasant, you know, experience dealing in these issues. And I think we'd be able to make a lot more forward progress than always feeling uh, like we have to defend ourselves as creationists. So, mm. yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. And, you know, as I, you're right, I, I gave a couple examples, uh, all from geology in, in my um, essay, it's over at the Henry Center. And uh, it's not to say or not to denigrate anybody else, but you know, as a geologist and a paleontologist, I wanted to highlight these. But you've, you've got folks in biology, you've got folks in physics and astronomy, folks in chemistry. And you, you take a look at something like the International Conference on Creationism. You, you and I got to meet up there briefly uh, yeah. this past summer, right? The International Conference on Creationism has as part of its you know, kind of bylaws and aim and goal, the furtherance of a creation model, right? So ICC yes. is dedicated towards infinite game thinking. Um, doesn't mean that every paper that go, gets in there is exactly you know, in line with that, but that's the goal, that's the, the approach. And we see that with um, Creation Research Society, we see that with the Creation Biology and Creation Geology Societies, forward game type of thinking, infinite game type of thinking. That's the stuff that is going to propel us to discover new and interesting stuff and to approach the world that God has made with that sense of joy and wonder. You know, why can we have joy when we have no money? Well, it's because you know there's still cool stuff outside. Grab a hammer and Amen. hit a rock and go see what you can find. And it's really kind of cool. So if yeah. we can bring our interest, you know, if, if we can show people 
that we actually love the creation for itself because of, of the fact that it's made by God. And we don't just look at the creation as a utilitarian item that can help us defeat some, you know, uh, mental construct, some ideology. And that's what we need to get away from in creationism. You can sense it's a lot of creationist writing. They just don't like things in the world. And you, know, you don't get that sense of joy and that wonder. It's just, oh, the, the evolutionists got this fossil. Well, let me tell you why they're wrong. Well, you know what? I, Let's take a look at it and go like, hey, this is really cool. You know, forget the noise for a minute. Just look at the thing itself. And wonder and marvel. This was something that God hid away for thousands of years. And now yeah. at this time, to be found. we get to find it. Praise God. Yep. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, I love that. That pursuit of discovery and wonder is um, uh, absolutely beautiful. So I think the more we focus on this, the better. Dr. Ross, thanks so much for your time. Is Cornerstone Educational Supply and Marcus Ross on all the socials, is that the best place to, to find you online? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can find us at cornerstone-edsupply.com. Uh, if you're looking for science stuff, if you're running a homeschool co-op or you've got some stuff that you want to get, you know, for e we got Easter eggs coming up here. Talk about fun stuff. We've got, uh, you know, minerals and fossils and uh, testimony stones in Easter eggs. It's fun stuff. Uh, why? Because God's world is fun. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in other stuff, Hop on YouTube, throw my name in there. And, uh, you know, the first seven or eight are probably going to be okay. After that, it gets to be, a, you know, the YouTube scrum and who knows what's on there, but you'll find a few things from me yeah. there. Very good. Very good. Thank you again so much, Dr. Ross. We certainly appreciate it and can't wait until next time for sure.